Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to a, another fantastic edition of, of Wisconsin Veterans Museum's Book Talk uh, virtual event. Um, today, we're going to be speaking with Diane Amato. But before we get started, um, I would just like to throw out a couple notes for everybody. Uh, first of all, I hope you're having a happy Monday. And if you are in the Madison or lower Wisconsin area, I hope you uh, survived the surprise snowstorm we had last night. Um, also, if uh, you are, if you have any questions for our speaker today, uh, we do have our security features turned on. So if you could please submit those questions to me via chat, um, I will make sure that the presenter gets all the questions at the end of the program. Uh, so just use the chat function and be sure to submit your questions that way. Uh, also, I would just like to say real quick, thank you to the Western Veteran Foundation for their continued support and all the free programming that we get to put on here at the museum. Not only our book talks and our curated conversations, but also our trivia nights, uh, our movie discussion nights, our drink and draw events, and all the other fantastic uh, uh, virtual events that we get to put on. So thank you again to the Wisconsin Veterans Museum Foundation for that. And as well um, to their sponsor, Generac Power System. Uh, without those two entities, we would not be able to put on all these virtual programs that we do. Uh, and they will continue throughout the rest of 2023. I'm sorry, 2022 and into 2023, absolutely. So please uh, go to wispetsmuseum.com to look for our other virtual events that are coming up and we hope to see everybody there. Uh, today, we welcome uh, to our book talk uh, venue, uh, Diane Amato, uh, who's going to be speaking about her newest work today, called All the News from Home, a World War II story of family, loyalty and love, which takes a look at the home front um, during World War II, and in particular in the Greenbush neighborhood uh, right here in Madison. Diane, thanks for joining us today. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Eric, so much. I, I really want to thank you and the Wisconsin Veterans Museum for the invitation to do the reading. And to the audience out there joining me today, thank you so much for being here. Uh, before I begin, begin to read my book, I'd like to start with a short history of my odyssey into writing the story. I am a big fan of epistolary style of writing. I love letters and diaries, travel logs from all eras. Letters are incredibly intimate and it's how people have been communicating for centuries. And they are of the moment and they're like no other style of writing. Um, they really let you stand in someone's shoes at the exact period of time that they were being put down. Uh, I still write letters, and I don't think I'm alone when you get that feeling of excitement after you open a handwritten letter from someone who's really dear to you. These particular letters are short and to the point, and often news is repeated because of the urgency to continue to communicate. It could be the difference between life and death. Uh, it was wartime, and as we know, horribly now, it, war is very unpredictable and brutal. And so while the pace is slow and can be mundane at times, it's because it's everyday life. They're written with consistency and this dedication to making sure that George knew he was not forgotten. Um, this is how families write to their loved ones who are fighting off in a war. They, they try to stay as close to them as possible. I'm also a history buff and nonfiction stories really intrigue me. So as the family historian of my own family, I pursued this project knowing that it would give me this precious, precious opportunity to get close to my parents. Um, so you can say the book is definitely a love letter to them. So many letters, I know they can be intimidating, but it was important for me to document them as I found them. I've said there's no right or wrong way to read the letters. You could read 10, you could read 100, you could read them all. But it really gives you a, this chance to experience a way of life that's so different than our fast paced world we live in today. So it's not a spy thriller <laughs> or action packed novel, but it really is just the simple story of one man's family during World War II, 1942 to 1945, in the bush in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, if I can make one suggestion to anyone who's interested in preserving their own family history, it's to get it down on paper or video. Stories tend to disappear over time. There is an organization through the Smithsonian Institute, some of you may know, called StoryCorps, C-O-R-P-S. And I recommend you look them up if you need any help organizing how to interview someone. 
These 600, and, uh, excuse me, 368 government issued V mail letters were written to my father, Technical Sergeant Joseph George Amato, while he was stationed in England as an embalmer during World War II. It was a gruesome, gruesome assignment. Uh, I came upon them in 1989 while I was house sitting. They were under my sister's bed in an old shoe box. They were dusty, yellowing, wrapped in disintegrating rubber bands. But as soon as I started to read them, um, they immediately opened up this world of the past in the bush. They reintroduced me to the neighborhood that I had long forgotten, and especially to my grandmother, Angela Alioto Amato, Ma, uh, who had died before I was born. So I embraced this pace of life and the details of how they lived and what they ate. I got to know my aunts and my uncles as young men and women who were just starting out their own lives and the relationship they had between them all. And the more I read, the more I found myself getting closer and closer to these people. And, and, it, and it really was remarkable. It wasn't just the direct family either. It was everyone that wrote the letters. And I, I laughed at their innocence and I cried when they're feeling their deep devotion to each other. Um, I really felt like I was standing with them while they relayed their day. And so I knew I wanted to share them, but it really did take me 30 years before I finally got the time to um, transcribe them. So picture number one. V mail letters are small and they're hard to um, read. So, uh, oh, hang on, I lost my, hang on. Um, excuse me. Uh, there's strange and peculiar syntax. Um, transcribing them led me to begin this big history into World War II, and the subject is so well documented, it was really imperative that I get the details right, and I align what my parents were going through in England to coincide with the same time frame as the letters. Um, Dad met my mother, Joan Lewis, who was an English nurse tending to the wounded in a hospital outside of London. They fell in love, they got married, and they had their first child before being reunited back in Madison after the war ended to start their life together in the bush. So with my father's blessing, I dove in and I lived in the world for three years. I'm gonna start with just a short passage from part one before moving on to some of my favorite letters. And I'll start with the first letter dated April 13th, 1942, and end with the last letter that abruptly ends on May 23rd, 1945. And then I'll move on to a few excerpts from the linear story of George and Joan in England in part two, and then we'll end with a couple of questions if there are any. The last thing I'd like to mention is um, there are maybe certain graphic descriptions of war that may trigger images or concepts that could be distressing to some people. So. Here we go. Picture two and 2A. Two in 1942, at the end, as the entire world caught fire, entangled in the chaos of World War II, one family's intimate experience with the war began to be told on the corner of Milton and Lake Street. It's an unpretentious and sincerely domestic tale conveyed through military issued V-mail letters. These wartime correspondences describe the love of a family on the home front for a son and a brother overseas. They reveal the sacrifices that were made and the painstaking effort it took to carry on, never knowing what the future held. In the small familiar details, the letters paint a rich and beautiful picture of everyday life in the bush. They are all the news from home. Picture number three. Uh, number three, yeah. A. Amato, 706 Milton Street, Madison, Wisconsin, August 13th, 1942. Dear George, we received three V-mail letters from you this week. I hope you receive some of the boxes by the time you get this letter. This is the first V-mail in Madison, and from now on, we'll try to write this way. Rosalind mixed you a box of fudge. I hope you get it, because it really came out good, and we know how you like fudge. Ma mailed you some pumpkin seeds in the package where she put the cigarettes in. That package was mailed on August 10th. You can ask us for anything, and if it's possible, you will receive it. Jack Puccio wants you to look you up in London, so we told his brother to write and tell him to look you up at the Washington Club. So be on the lookout for him. 
we're all fine. And we had the tires recapped on the Buick and they came out good. They didn't touch the white walls at all. Ma's fine. And if you see this letter before your birthday, we all wish you a happy birthday. We haven't heard anything of the allotment for the month of August, and I don't even know where to inquire about it. So you better check on it. In the meantime, if we receive it, I'll let you know. Well, goodbye. Right soon, your sister, Marion. And A. Amato, 706 Milton Street, Madison, Wisconsin, September 21st, 1942. Dear George, received your letter. Oh, excuse me, I wrote the red the wrong one. This is from Miss Roslyn Schiavo, 531 Regent Street. Dear Georgie, received your letter. I was very glad to hear from you. No, I didn't forget to write you, but I never have much to write about. I don't mind taking care of the store as long as it helps your mother a little. Your sister Marion bought some penny candy for the store. When the kids come in to buy candy, they take a whole year before they decide what kind they like. I'm so glad to hear you're not sick anymore. I imagine seasickness is an awful feeling. I know whenever I go for a ride in a car, I get car sick, and it isn't such a nice feeling either. Georgie, didn't you know I was swimming since I was 10? I'm not such a bad swimmer either. There I go bragging again. Jimmy, the great teacher, taught me how to swim. Georgie, you're excused for not dancing with me so much at Marion's wedding. I know you wouldn't be here for so long, so I knew you wanted to have some fun. By the way, I don't have the same kind of fun you have when you go to the cottage, get me? I sent you some homemade fudge and it did come out good. I made it real thick with some nuts, just like you get in the candy store. My father sends his first one today. Everyone sends their love. May God bless you and keep you, Rosalind. A. Amato, 706 Milton Street, Madison, Wisconsin, December 22nd, 1942. Dear George, here it is two days before Christmas and nobody in this house is excited. With this war, who could be? Jafalo, Oscar Caruso, and two of the Balderman boys, Joe and Charlie left for the army yesterday. I read in the paper yesterday that Mary Southworth was fined $100 for disorderly conduct. Remember her? Doris Rhodes sent Sammy a card. Sammy is crazy about Rosalind. He bought her a locket for Christmas. He makes me laugh. He's in a daze. My in-laws gave me $20 for my birthday. I still have it. I don't know what to get. I can't think of anything. Ma has all the groceries for Christmas and it's meat and butter hard to get. We're allowed 23 gallons a week for gas in the truck, besides four a week for a Buick. Believe me, I almost passed out. I don't get it. There's plenty of snow on the ground now. It was slippery last night. Mike bought Danny a new coat for Christmas and Jim and I bought him a new pair of shoes. Sam got a suit. It's real classy. I bet you don't remember what you look like as a civilian. Right now, Ma's at church for Novena. She's okay. Well, no other news. Let us know how you spent the holidays. Good luck, Marion. A. Amato, 706 Milton Street, Madison, Wisconsin, January 31st, 1943. Dear George, I met all your old girlfriends last night at the tavern. Janine, Betty, and Patty, and a girl by the name of Nellie. Mike takes her out when he comes to Madison. She chums around with the other three girls. Janine asked me for your address. She's married now to some fellow in the army. They're looking for an apartment. They wanted to rent one of Ma's, but she has them all rented. Betty said you drove her to Waterloo, and I said, no wonder my mother has to buy a new car every two years. They certainly laughed over that. They're really nice girls to talk to. Effie stole a chicken in the store today, and I had to go over and get it. Ma got a hold of her, and if I hadn't stopped her, I don't know what would have happened. Ma was plenty sore. I had to put Effie out. You know how she gets when she's tight. I never laughed so hard in my life. She better not come back. We're all fine. Ma's okay. Right now she's in the store yelling about that chicken. It's snowing real hard outside. Mrs. Ryan baptized their baby today. Roy Sowglass and Mrs. Ryan's aunt were godparents. Have you received any packages? Let us know. Marion. 
picture four. Sam D'Amato, 706 Milton Street, Madison, Wisconsin, February 19th, 1943. Dear George, I'm so sorry I have not written to you. I've been very busy between the funeral home and the store. I'm going crazy. You know, George, I'm in love. I know you know who it is, Rosalind Schiavo. She will make me a very nice and adorable wife. I might have to go to work pretty soon because I'm gonna get married and I better start saving up my money. I worked at the Badger Ordnance Plant, Merrimack, for about seven months and Mr. Boosie said he'd like to have me back. I'm trying to get into the post office. It will be near my home and near my future wife. Paul Ryan's wife got a little baby boy and they named him Mike. That makes seven children. He said he's getting them ready for the next big fight, fighting World War III. Paul Ryan's mom died. He gave her a copper casket. You know Kushner from Wanakee? We named him Reverend Kushner. One day he came to the funeral home and he was drunk. He came to town with a furniture truck. I think it was a 1925 Model T Ford truck. You should have seen him. I gave him a hundred mask cards goes outside and falls in the snow and all the mask cards go up in the air and land in the snow. He was kneeling in the snow picking up all the mask cards. Then he gets in his truck and you should have seen him the way he was driving. The next day he had to go to Wanakee and direct the funeral. He was too sick to direct it. Then Mr. Kushner wrecked his 1939 Buick and got a new Pontiac. Did you get Rosalind's fudge? Well, having nothing else to say, so long, brother. Give you all the luck. May God be with you. I hope you come home soon so we can fight for the car again. Mother sends all her love for you. Your loving brother, Sam D. Amato. Picture number five. Mrs. D. Parisi, 638 Milton Street, Madison, Wisconsin, April 12th, 1943. Dear George, very glad to hear from you and also that you're getting along fine. I hope you still are. Both my kids have the measles and if you think I am not going nutty, you'll have to guess again. Nellie's kids have them too. One of these days, they'll probably throw the mattress out of the window. They kill each other in bed. I had to separate them today. Joe Skiro asked me what I did to deserve such two lively kids. He means what I did to God. He got examined here for the army. He's waiting to go to Milwaukee. Ralph DeSalvio enlisted in the Flying Navy Cadets. He's waiting to be called. Dimmy, all the guys got papers to fill out so they can be reclassified. Did you know Ruth is getting married any day now? The guy's about 40 years old. Poor Joe, go crazy. Lucky for you, you did not leave a steady girl behind. My sister Rosie quit school because she did not have enough points to graduate. She's gonna have to look for a job. That boyfriend she told you about, I hope he meets another girl before the war is over. It's very nice, but I don't want her to marry him because he drinks. He doesn't think about her half as much as Bill does over Carolyn. Happy Easter, love from us all, Mary Parisi. James Schiavo, 706 Milton Street, Madison, Wisconsin, May 8th, 1943. Dear George, don't fall over when you find out who wrote this letter to you. Gee, but I miss all the good times Joe Lopresto, you and I used to have. Remember when I used to pay the caddy to move the ball ahead when we played golf together? I was also thinking of all the good times we had when we went to Columbus to the dances. Boy, how we all argued who was going to have to pay for the gas. Hmm, today there isn't enough to gas to, to argue about. Did you know that Jeannie had a baby a few months ago? Is whiskey ever hard to get? We are rationed two cases a week. Now we're not able to give away any free drinks. But I have a case put away for you and I when you come home to sponsor for the baby. Coming event is July 1st. Wish you were here. Your brother-in-law, Jim. Angela Amato, 706 Milton Street, Madison, Wisconsin, May 14th, 1943. Dear George, we received three letters from you yesterday. Ma says she's glad you received the socks and the handkerchiefs. Did you plant the seeds already? Ma got me out of bed this morning because everybody went to the farm. I'm gonna tell you a secret. Mary Parisi's gonna have a baby. 
but she didn't want me to tell you. She said she's going to surprise you. So don't let on like I told you. I suppose you know that Joe Lopresto got, Joe Lopresto's girl got married. She married a guy way older than her. I can just picture Joe. He must be plenty mad. Everybody here is okay and look into the day when you can come home. Yesterday, the big colored guy, big bull, Bill Irwin, that lives with Effie, stabbed Charlie Bass. He lives across to my father-in-law. Boy, there sure was a lot of excitement around here while the cops were looking for him. They found him under the viaduct on South Park Street. I think Charlie Bass is going to die. I sure pity that Negro. <sighs> That's all there is new here. We all send our regards. Let me know about the watch. Marion. Mrs. Angela Amato, 706 Milton Street, Madison, Wisconsin, August 11th, 1943. Handwritten by Rosie Troya, signed by Ma. Dear son, I have had no answer from you for the cablegram I sent you August 6th, telling you of Marion and her fine baby boy. Then I sent you a letter and now this one. In case there should be a slow up in the mail, I will tell you again that the baby's name is Anthony Joseph Schiavo, middle name for you. Dear son, now I wish to tell you that I received the last check in June and I haven't had any more since. Now I want to tell you that you should look forward to the last package I sent to you. In it was your shoes and glasses, some gum, lipstick, and tuna fish. You say you needed a fountain pen. Please write letter saying so. That way I can show your letter and get it for you. Here's hoping you are fine and happy. I am your loving mother, Mrs. Angela Amato. Mrs. Angeline Amato, 706 Milton Street, Madison, Wisconsin, August 27th, 1943, handwritten by Rosie Troya, signed by Ma. Dear son, I received your letter and you told me that you have received no mail within the last 15 days, not from carelessness, George, but due to your sister Marion's care. She did have a hard time and a worry for me, son. It is three weeks today that the baby was born and she's still in the hospital. But please do not have this worry you because Marion has improved and is doing well. The baby, of course, is just fine, plump, lively little fellow. Dear son, another thing. Whatever you have sent to ask us for, I have sent so truthfully you have hurt my feelings and I feel mistreated that you should send to ask for your girl's stockings from your Aunt Virginia. Have I ever refused you anything you needed? Please remember, I want to see you once again before I die. Your loving mother, Mrs. Angeline Amato. Letter number six, I mean, excuse me, picture number six. Michael J. Amato, 931 North Jackson Street, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, October 8th, 1943. Dear Joe, I just received your letter dated September 27th. I'm glad to hear that everything is settled and that you are to be married. Ma has the ring and she's waiting to hear from you so that she knows where to send it. Uncle John just got back from New York, but he did not see Joe. We had a funeral this morning and have another for tomorrow morning. Things have been quiet. Has Joan received my letter because I'm waiting to get one from her? Has she wrote to Mary? I saw Joan's picture and she sure looks like Greer Garson. Have you received the cross as yet? How's Joan's brother? As for the wedding gift, you'll have to wait till you get back from the U.S. because there can't, you can't buy anything around here. I wish you both the best of luck and that you both cherish each other. I certainly wish I was there to see you get married. Don't forget to send some pictures. If you need anything, let me know. Love, Michael. Sergeant Lepresto, 18th Fighter, PO 986, November 6, 1943, Seattle, Washington. Dear George, just received your October 17th letter and was glad to hear from you finally. I'm in fine and in good health. Congratulations on your marriage. I suppose it's over by now, so I hope it will be a much one of happiness to you and to her. I know your ma don't like it, but you have to live with it, so... Here's to your luck and happiness. Hope to be released within six months. Gosh, how I'm sweating it out. I'm also sweating out this damn war. 
Benny Bilateri told me he saw your wife's picture and he told me she was a honey. And if he says so, she really must be. Well, George, take it easy. Have a good time of married life for me, will you? Your pale always, Joe. Picture number seven. Michael J. Amato, 931 North Jackson Street, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, November 13th, 1943. Oh, back up. Picture seven. There you go. Dear Joe, I received your letter dated November 4th, 1943. That was the day I was supposed to be inducted, but I wasn't. I got a 60 day delayed induction. I also received a letter from Joan and answered it. I hope you received this letter on your wedding day and I hope Joe Elioto is there with you. I'll bet Joan looks beautiful, all dressed in white. Who's the best man? I wish I was there to be him. Is a church full of people? I bet you and Joan are very happy and that you will both remain that way all your lives. Don't forget the ring. Did they get there all right? Has she got the gold cross on? What's Joe Alioto doing? Is the bride late? Has the organ began to play? Are you sober? Are you nervous? Where are you going on your honeymoon? Well, it's all over with. Go treat her swell because I take it she's a swell girl. Maybe we can spend your first anniversary together. Then we'll all celebrate the wedding all over again. Best of luck, write soon. Send some pictures, love to you both. Michael. Michael J. Amato, 931 North Jackson Street, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, January 14th, 1944. Dear Joe, I'm very sorry I couldn't write before, but we've been very busy. How's Joan and Joe Elioto? If you want to send Joan here, mother would be more than happy to take her in. The other day I received my induction notice. I'm to be inducted January 21st, but I have to have a hearing January 17th on whether I get 30 or 60 days. So I'll let you know how I come out. We've been very busy. Since January 2nd, we've had five jobs, one in Madison. One was a girl, 32 years old, shot herself in the head. One was a fellow called Cosmo DeSalvo from Milwaukee, 39 years old, heart trouble. One was a fellow, 29 years old, he was shot by a policeman for robbery. And one was a 64 year old man, heart trouble. Give my love to Joan and Joe and tell Joan I really look forward to seeing her. If I'm not in the army, love, Michael. Pictures eight, nine, 10, and 11. Angela Motto, 706 Milton Street, Madison, Wisconsin, June 7th, 1944. Dear George, well, today the invasion began. Here in the States, all the people went to church and everyone had their radios on to hear the news. It seems to be good news and the casualties light. I pray that God lets this finish in a hurry and all the boys come back safe. I suppose Joe Alioto is in the middle of it. I pray that he comes home safe and sound and Pray that you won't be transferred. I hope that you stay stationed there for the duration. Did Joan's brother go over too? Ernest Nania landed in Africa and Dick Chula too. They met each other over there. We are mailing you a package containing Joan's two smocks. Also included are some things that I'm sending Joan for the baby. Two pairs of booties, a blue bunting, a dozen diapers. In there, there's also some baby shirts made of linen. Those are the ones you wore when you were a baby and Ma thought they'd be nice for your baby to have. Have you received Joan's coat yet? I sure hope so. I'm listening to the radio talk about the invasion. That's all that's on the radio. Well, good luck to you both and God keep you safe. Please write, Marion. Picture 12 and 13. Angela Motto, 706 Milton Street, Madison, Wisconsin, November 20th, 1944. Dear George, well, today we received the first letter from you telling us about the baby. I'll bet she looks like a doll. I suppose by now Joan is home from the hospital. Where is she gonna stay now? Not in London, I hope, with the baby. After seeing the film about the buzz bomb, let her stay anywhere but there. It's just awful, please be careful. Every night when I read about the buzz bomb, I get scared. Ma was pleased and proud that you named the baby Angela. Everyone had to see the letter today telling it about the baby. 
Right now she's over at Cousin Mamie's with the baby. Sam is back from his honeymoon. I guess he's going back to work tomorrow. I forgot to tell you that Ma had all the store shelves lowered. Now they start from the floor up, just like the big stores. They're much easier to reach and look much better. This week is Thanksgiving. Are you going to be on civilian rations on that day? I suppose the food's plenty skimpy there. If you need anything for the baby, let us know, like cod liver oil and such. We'll keep writing and let us know if you need anything. Love to you, Joan, and baby, Miriam. Picture 14. Angela Amato, 706 Milton Street, Madison, Wisconsin, May 23rd, 1945. Dear George, we got two letters today saying you have arranged for Joan's transportation home. I hope by the time you get this letter, she will be on her way here. I'll bet you'll be happy to get a discharge from the army. Then when little Angela gets older, you can tell her how she was responsible for your discharge with your 12 points. Everything's the same here, just a lot of hard work in the store. Business is good and Ma's doing well. You haven't met, seen Tony yet. He has done everything imaginable a baby can do. Someday I expect to look up on the ceiling and find him walking up there though. This is how naughty he is. Mike gets the biggest kick out of him. He follows Mike around like a little dog. Charlie Parisi wrote home and said his mother said he ate over at his house. He said the baby looks like Ma and she's so happy about that. At last report, Mike said he's going to wait till you come home and get married. Then Ma will be happy. Mike and I had quite a discussion about that last week when he went and wanted to see him. Well, give her love to Joan and the baby. We hope to see them soon. And you too, love from all, Marion. And that's the end of the letters. And now part two, picture 15. Joseph Anthony George Amato was inducted into the U.S. Army on January 9th, 1942. At 23 years old, George was a handsome man of Sicilian descent with olive skin, a bright smile, and thick coal black hair that he combed straight back. He had a distinctive high-pitched voice, a result of a birth defect on his vocal cords, and strong hands that flew out in front of him. Growing up in the bush, George had a healthy independent streak, and at times, was a handful for Ma to raise. Picture 16 and 17. George learned that the Graves Registration Corps, the GRC, were set up in a hotel and given cash for living expenses. Walking, located in Northwest Surrey, was home to the Necropolis Brookwood Military Cemetery. It was now an American military base. Preparing bodies for burial in the quiet of peacetime was very different from burying the dead during wartime. Every day they were brought in, young men with their whole lives in front of them. Often the bodies were mangled, fragmented, or burned beyond recognition, and George had to place the remaining pieces back together in their coffins. Some arrived without a mark on their young faces, but deadly shrapnel had pierced their strong bodies and so many suicides. George knew that this was his contribution to fighting the good fight, so he put his head down and got the job done. He respectfully cleaned the powder burns and their fatal gunshot wounds and their mud cake corpses in advanced stages of decomposition. The trauma of this job never left George, and PTSD and the images he saw on a daily basis would continue to haunt him till the end of his life. Picture 18. One evening, as he was walking into the hotel dining room before dinner, George noticed a posting on the call board inviting all U.S. soldiers to a Christmas party sponsored by the Walking Memorial Hospital. As he sat down for his meal, a buddy from his outfit came over and asked him if he was going to the dance. He had a girlfriend who was a nurse over at the hospital, and her friend needed a date. Would he be interested? She was also a nurse, and he swore she looked just like Greer Garson. George was definitely interested. Formal introductions were made and George heard her name for the first time, Joan Lewis. He just couldn't believe that this gorgeous girl was his date for the night. She looked refined and smart and sexy all at the same time, and he couldn't take his eyes off of her. He realized his staring was making her uncomfortable, so he asked her to dance. 
As he walked back to the hotel, his head was swimming, his heart was pounding, he felt as light as a feather. He had memorized every detail of her lovely face, her golden hair, the way she smiled and smelled. He said her name over and over, Joan Lewis, Joan Lewis. He'd never felt this way about a girl before and he could not wait to see her again. Picture 19. As the two of them strolled to the park to get home to the hospital before curfew, a full moon illuminating their pathway, the air raid sirens began to blow. Long, painful, haunting moans that rose and fell and rose and fell, warning people to take shelter. As the sirens wailed, they knew they might only have moments to reach safety. The look on Joan's face said it all. Terrified, she wrapped her arm through his and held it tightly as they ran towards the shelter. As the walls crumbled around them, stunned Brits stared blankly into the darkness while others softly sang. Within seconds, the German planes were heard overhead. After just dropping bombs on London, 30 miles away, they were scattering in every direction while trying to avoid the RAF Spitfire or the Tempest fighter planes or the on-ground AK-AK guns trying to bring them down. The fury of the war was felt right through to the soul. As the smell of cordite crept down the stairs, George and Joan held each other tightly and their passionate kiss temporarily distracted them from their fear. Why they did not know what the future held for them, living in the moment was the only thing that made sense. After that evening, George and Joan were exclusive. He showered her with gifts with whatever he could get from the American PX and, and with what he received from back home, nylons and lipstick and sugar and gum. The bombs fell and the bodies kept coming, but throughout all the turmoil and havoc that lay at their feet, Cupid's arrow had struck and they were falling in love. Picture number 20. American GI Joseph George Amato was marrying Joan Helen Lewis, his English war bride at St. Dunstan's Catholic Church in Woking, England on Sunday, November 24th, 1943, three o'clock in the afternoon. George paced back and forth in front of the church, shaking hands with guests who filled in, filed in. He wanted another cigarette, but he just put one out. And a block away, he noticed a familiar figure walking briskly towards him. As the figure got closer, a grin swept across George's face. It was none other than his cousin, Joe Eliotto. He made it. Picture 21 and 22. War-torn England was not a place for tuxedos, nor a long white satin dress with a train. But George was pinched sharp in his regulated army uniform jacket, his coal black hair slicked back with William's hair oil Marion had sent from home, and his shine leather shoes and brass buttons catching the afternoon light. Joan was stunning in her perfectly fitted charcoal gray wool suit with matching suede gloves. She wore a wide brim hat with a veil that showed off her gorgeous blonde curls. As the music began, Tommy and Joan began their walk down the aisle. Standing at the altar was George were, with George were Winnie and Joe. And there it was, in the midst of chaos and death and destruction of war, the moment that Joan and George had dreamed of was finally becoming a reality. With each Friday evening finally arriving, he and Joan would eagerly meet at the walking train station and take the 30 minute train ride up to London Joan's mother owned two apartments in Putney, and they had set up a very simple home in one of them. For two glorious days each week, they took the underground and rode the trams and the red double-decker buses to explore the London that jo Joan knew so well. Joan's brother Tommy and his girlfriend Marge often took them out to different nightclubs in the West End. Every spot filled with men and women in uniform and the sound of big band music following them through the streets as they went from one club to the next. But as exciting and as romantic as it was, there was always an awareness that at any moment the city might experience a blackout and be under siege, and the brutality of the blitz would come crashing down around them. By the end of March 1944, Joan was pregnant. 
She and George were elated. They both wanted a family. And in spite of the war, they were looking forward to the day when peace would once again settle over the world. Picture 23, 24, and 25. Wartime London was dangerous and bleak. And by this point in the war, every street corner, every understock store, and every word that was uttered was a reminder of what the British were up against. George worried constantly about Joan. The Germans attacked relentlessly and started to deploy their V-1 bomb rockets to bomb the city. These unmanned rockets were an early version of the cruise missile and were launched by the Luftwaffe from the German-occupied French and Dutch coasts. Traveling at a speed of 400 miles an hour, the V-1s went straight up in the air, then zeroed in on the direction of England, where they would make a steep dive towards London. The buzz bombs, or doodle bugs, as they were called, looked like small airplanes and made a roar like 100 motorcycles screaming overhead. The sound was deafening and the effect was utterly terrifying. Just before the bomb struck, the fuel was cut off from the engine and the air was thin with an eerie 10 second pause. The silence meant that the bomb was gliding in to hit its mark and explode. On impact, the V-1 destroyed everything around it could take out four city blocks at a time. In all, there were over 10,000 V-1 rockets launched against London during World War II. 2,400 of them reached the city, killing almost 32,000 people and injuring over 87,000. Picture number 27. In early May 1945, things began to shift in, jo shift in Joan and George's world. George received papers informing him that he would be transferred to France. He said goodbye to his company at the 27. Yeah. He said goodbye to the company at the Gray's Registration Corps and closed the book on that chapter of his life. The day of his departure for France arrived, not knowing when or if they would ever see each other again. Made the little family's prolonged goodbye tearful and agonizing. While he'd been apart from Joan before, George had never experienced pain like this. Twenty-eight, twenty-nine, and thirty. They finally started to form GIs into groups. Those with high service points went first, and since George had over 90 points, he was put into that first group. So on October 10th, 1945, he squeezed onto a jam-packed cargo bucket bound for New York. Thirty-one and thirty-two. As anyone who has traveled by ship can tell you, pulling into the New York Harbor after being away from home for any length of time is an emotional experience. The Statue of Liberty and the unmistakable New York skyline were welcome sights to those coming home in 1945. America was George's homeland, and as proud as he was to have been given the opportunity to defend its constitution on foreign soil, he was grateful and relieved to have made it back in one piece. 33 and 34. On October 26, 1945, Fourth Technical Sergeant Joseph George Amato was honorably discharged from the United States Army. He had spent three years and 10 months in the military and 90% of his time on foreign soil. He experienced much sadness and many hours as he buried the dead during his call of duty. But as fate would have it, he met the love of his life and for that reason, he wouldn't have changed a thing. George's homecoming was just as joyous as they'd all imagined it would be. He met his nephew, Tony Boy, who jumped up and down yelling, Georgie, 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 over and over again. He was just as naughty as the letters had said he was. Sam had gotten married, but was still the joker he'd always been, play punching his older brother as they danced around the kitchen. He filled out in his white t-shirt, hugged his defined biceps. Mike wore a suit and tie and grinned at him from under his hat. He couldn't wait to discuss his big plans to make some real money now that George was home. His sister Marion, the family rock and voice of reason, giggled and lovingly touched his face as tears streamed down her own cheeks. 
how she had waited and prayed for this day. And Ma, well, she couldn't stop kissing her son. She cried so much that the family had to help her to a chair for fear that she might faint from all the emotion. She immediately lit a candle at the small altar near her bedroom and gave thanks to God for bringing her boy back to her. 35, 36, and 37. The train to Chicago was delayed two interminable hours. Thousands of former GIs from all over the Midwest anxiously awaited their wives' arrival with George, smoking and pacing up and down the platform. The train was filled to capacity, and as it pulled into Union Station, hundreds of eager faces pressed to the windows, searching for their loved ones. George's eyes darted up and down the platform, searching for Joan, when just like that, he spotted the most beautiful woman in the crowd. In her arm, she held a curious little girl with a head full of soft, light brown curls. Their reunion was a mixture of joy and relief as tears streamed down their cheeks. They had done it. Their dream of being together and peacefully raising a family in America was finally a reality. All the waiting, the sacrifices, the anxiety and the loneliness slipped away as they wrapped each other in a loving embrace. Pictures 38 and 39. At the end of February, shortly after Joan arrived in Madison, a snowstorm hit the Midwest, making the streets of the bush impassable. There were no deliveries, visits from friends or passing cars, just a hush that settled across the entire neighborhood. The snow gently fell and the still houses were silhouette by the dim street lights. For a moment, the war seemed a distant memory. George and Joan bundled jo Angela onto an old wooden sled and made the trek through the silent streets of the safe bush towards Kennedy Dairy on West Washington Avenue to buy milk. As George watched his beautiful English war bride and his precious daughter happily make their way through the snow, he couldn't help but think that he was the luckiest gank on earth. The end. That's it. <sighs> And there's yeah. so much of a story there, Diane. I, it, it, it's, it's even hard to, to try to, you know, summarize it all in just an hour uh, without going through that whole book. Just what a, what a fantastic way to bring those letters to life. Yes. Um, between, yeah. between your parents and your grandparents and all your family members. Um, just well done. Uh, Thank I really, you. I really enjoyed that presentation. Uh, our first question, and I'm sorry, because I, I, I had op many open screens. I didn't have a chance to put... All these questions in the PowerPoint, so I just have to ask them uh, aloud. Sure. Um, uh, how, how long did it take you to put all these letters together um, into a form that was basically fit for print? It was a long process. Uh, it it was the technology was there, luckily with dictation on my iMac. Um, but it was uh, three years, over three years, three and a half years of. Um, putting them chronologically, and I had a magnifying glass, light, I mean, and, the, and there's, through all those letters, there's only one word that I couldn't decipher, and some of the words I couldn't decipher for like a year, and finally, something would click, and I would, it would make sense to me, um, so it, it took three and a half years to get that organized enough to get it to print. Um, and in the photos as well, I how long did it take you to come up with those photos? Um, you know, re researching through the family, you know, shoe boxes and, and things like that. That's what happened. I, I had a lot of the photos from my dad, but I put that out to my sisters. So I have three sisters and I was like, I'm writing this book and if you have any pictures, please let them know. And they were dawdling and then they were not, then, then they would finally, they would give me some and it would, they would be fantastic. The, the picture of my father's, the, the wedding of all of them together, um, I looked high and low. I kept telling my sisters, there's a picture of the whole, all of them and nobody could find that picture, nobody. And then one day I'm helping, after the book had been published, I'm looking through my sister's, th I find that, that picture. <laughs> I say, here it is, but it's too late. Um, so it was just, a, you know, three years of just keep asking, 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 going through letters. Um, I had some uh, pictures that were stuck inside letters. So, yeah, it was, that's all I have. Unfortunately, I wish I had a lot more, right? But that's what I had. 
So there wasn't anything else included with the letters, like, you know, maybe used ration cards or, or anything like that that came from the family? Those letters, no. They were just that big pile with the, the disintegrating rubber bands and everything. Um, no, there was nothing else with them. I did find uh, some little books, these books that the GIs would read, very simple sort of mindless passing time kind of books, but that was it. I didn't find really anything else from him. And, and then I, he also had the, uh, the jacket that we donated to the museum. That was also oh, included there, yeah. Um, aside from the V-mails, did you use any other kind of correspondence uh, in putting this book together? I noticed and you, you said a couple of times there were some handwritten letters, um, but was, can you just kind of elaborate a little bit on, on what else went into uh, putting this whole story together? Well, I went to Madison <laughs> a few times and I got to go over to the um, Italian Workmen's Club and uh, I went inside and, uh, you know, my grandmother's house is long gone because Milton and Lake Street has now something else. But I would get out of my, park my car and I would walk the neighborhood over there and just feel the air on my skin, the, the breathe. I, I just tried to put myself there at this time when these letters were written to just, and, and air really kind of transcends centuries, you know, you know, the, the, the era of Madison, Wisconsin during the summer is the same as it was when I was a kid and I can, I can smell that. So I tried to put myself in that place. I, I walked over to um, Brittingham Park just to get the feeling of what wow. that felt like. Tried to do that, tried to just put myself in, into that place. I also um, did some research with a woman by the name of Kath, Kate Letourneau. She's a hundred and three maybe wow. and she has the memory of a steel trap <laughs> and she's a lovely lovely lady I, I she answered a lot of my questions for example do you remember um this one girl that had oh yeah I remember her and she had a really mean dog she'll say I mean she she remembered so much so I had two chances to talk to her also um Go, focusing on your mother a little bit um, with her, her English ancestry, was it very difficult for her to come to the U.S. Uh, during the war? Uh, no, no. They uh, were, they were 350,000 wartime brides. They knew that they had to get that organized to bring them over here because they were going to come whether they, you know, wanted them or not. So they were very organized. What the, the problem was her family. I mean, they were just aghast that she was falling in love with a Yank and a, a, a Sicilian on top of, I mean, they, you know, and they'd never heard of Madison, Wisconsin. There could be Indians there for all they knew. <laughs> so they're, they're, that was the hard part, getting her family, getting her sister to talk her mother into it. And George was on his best Madison etiquette behavior, right? And he would bring things to them that he'd gotten at the PX or his mother had sent him and they, you know, they had nothing. They had nothing. So he would find butter and uh, she didn't say, you know, little by little, they they actually came around and um, and they were so in love. So it was- well, They had to experience some of that Midwest nice, huh? Yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> and that kind of segues into the next question perfectly. Um, did your mom's parents view of your father change over time? Did they finally come to accept him as this great guy and um, you know, oh, as a yeah. son-in-law? Definitely. Um, her, her father had already died. Uh, my grandfather had, was a boot maker and he died of poisoning. All that oh. terrible um, uh, dyes, you know, to the on the leather. So he died quite young when she was quite young. And um, uh, dad was, they loved him. They loved him. My dad was a very likable guy, really nice man. Uh, and he loved his family and he adored my mother. And, you know, she, she gave her, they had four children together. And so we would go to England uh, a few times as kids. Um, so they, they did accept him wholeheartedly. So at, at some point you were able to meet your, your grandparents on the other side of the pond? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah. 
Um, did your father's letters describe any of the damage uh, that was going on, like in, in detail? Will we, will we see that in, in, in any parts of the book? So I only have a couple letters of my father's. All the letters I have are coming from the United States. I do have a couple of his letters, um, but no, he, would he didn't mention any of that. Kept it very light. Oh, I got a bicycle in one of them. Um, no, I don't, I don't know. He wasn't the kind of person that was gonna write down what he was seeing. In fact, he didn't really talk about it until much later in his life. And, um, you know, the PTSD did, at the end of his life, it was just horrible. So he, oh. he had seen so much that I think he was just trying to stay in the moment of being in love and keeping it light. And that makes yeah. sense, especially with the job that he performed over there. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the, the, the second to last question, it did touch on, on, you know, whether your father experienced any sort of PTSD when he came back home and whether you and your, your siblings saw that. Uh, apparently, uh, that is the case. Uh, that's unfortunate. Um, but yeah. it's it's a, it's a byproduct of um, that type of environment for sure. Right, and I think that um, he really held held on to that or buried it for his most of his life. It wasn't until he was in his nineties and dementia was creeping in, and he would he would be staring off into space, and he kept saying he would he would be saying they were so young, they were so young. I mean, it was just like barreling over him and we would try to distract him and and that would work but you know he he would talk about how many suicides there were which i didn't know that and and he said you know people don't talk about it but they're during war there are so many guys that just can't do it you know so yeah that's that's but, definitely a subject that's not touched upon much uh and to be quite honest you know although as historians we do hear about that I was still a little, I don't want to say shocked, but I was a little surprised when I heard you talking about that. It's like, yeah. oh yeah, you, you, yeah. you, you forget yeah. that that sort of thing does happen as well. Right, right. Um, and, and I'll kind of bring it back to a, a little more of a lighthearted tone with this last question. Um, I'm sorry, second to last question. Um, have you done any uh, genealogical research on your family? Um, you know, to, to trace you know, the so-called family tree back uh, as far as you possibly can. And what have you found out um, when you've done that sort of, of research? Uh, I have. Um, I didn't do the 23andMe, although my sisters have done it. And so the, the, I don't know how much they've got from that. But I did, um, I, did I, I continue to do it. Um, I have one English aunt who's in almost 90 and she's quite lucid and has pictures that she's given me. So I was able to oh, get back to 1790 with my English parent, uh, my English mother, and on my father's side, um, we get back to great great grandfather. I'm actually going to Sicily in September. Wow! If everything goes well in the world, because um, I've never been, and I'm going to do a little bit of um, traveling around and finding places where my grandmother and my grandfather were were born. That's a that's that's quite a, an adventure, and I hope I hope things stay at least yeah. somewhat you know, copacetic for you to be able to take that trip. Fingers crossed I for do you. Too. I do too. Uh, and then the last question, uh, one of our guests uh, wants to know, do you still have that fudge recipe? <laughs> you know who might have it is my cousin Cece Amato because Rosalind was her mother. And um, yeah, that, that sounds really good with the nuts. And, and I love the way that just like in the store, yeah, you know, just yeah. like, just like, and I bet it was too. So um, I don't know, but I could contact her and see if she might might have been handed down from generation to generation. Well, if, if, you, if you do and, and you feel like sharing that, I know a couple of people here at the museum uh, would like to, to like to try that recipe and see if it does taste it. just like from the store. I love that. Right. Well, Diane, thank you for such a great presentation uh, and for sharing, you know, your family uh, and, and how they all just came together and how your parents' lives started. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, we greatly appreciate it. And for those of you out there who were in our audience today, we thank you for, for coming out and uh, being with us for this book talk today. Uh, please visit our website, wisvetsmuseum.com. Uh, you can find some of our uh, other upcoming events, such as Trivia Night. Um, our, we have a special 
uh, live drink and draw presentation in just a couple weeks as we have gallery night here as well. Uh, so look forward to those. Um, and we look forward to seeing you uh, throughout uh, the rest of the year. Uh, thank you again. And Diane, thank you again for joining us today as well. You're welcome, Eric. And thanks to the museum too. You guys are doing a great job there. I can't wait to come to Madison and come visit.